Hello and welcome to The Travel Show, coming to you this week from Bonnie, Scotland, where we'll be discovering some of this region's distinctive dwellings stretching back to the Neolithic age. Also coming up on this week's show... We pay a visit to one of the most remote bars in the world. Mike looks ahead to the Rugby World Cup in trending travel. And we're in Buenos Aires, where tango's been given a bit of a shake-up. I prefer to follow, and my favourite thing about following is that every leader has a different story to tell. We're starting this week here in the Outer Hebrides, or Western Isles. A group of islands off the extreme northwest coast of Scotland. Known for their rugged beauty and wildlife, it's also where you'll find these. They're called Cranogs, and they might just seem like random, small, overgrown islands, but they were once ancient man-made lock dwellings during the Iron Age. they could be even older than we think. Newly found artefacts now date them back even further to the Neolithic age around 5,000 years ago. And I'm with the man who found them all right here at this beautiful lock. Yeah, just over there on the island, on the, the west side of the island, uh, the right hand side of it, that's where I found the Neolithic material. They are about 15 feet off there, yeah. Well, in the early days, when I was air crew on the Coast Guard helicopter and astronomy here, I noticed quite a number of lochs with uh, little islets on them. That, uh, they didn't look natural at all. They looked like they were just two round, some had walls around them, and I thought, well, I wonder what was going on in these lochs many, many years ago. So tell me, what did you find in this lock and other locks around here? What I did find was uh, beautifully decorated ceramics. Uh, under the water here, but I think the most specific find I did make on the bottom of this loch around the island there, near the island, was uh, an almost complete Unston bowl. Yeah, my archaeologist friend, uh, uh, Mark Elliott, I gave him a phone call, he came down to have a look at the stuff, and uh, he took his glasses off, put them back on again, and he says, where did you find this stuff? I says, I found it in the loch here, and uh, he says, you don't find that stuff here. Oh, I says, I didn't put it there. He says, you don't know what you found here, boy, this is early Neolithic, and it's not supposed to be here. All the islets and islands only go back to the Iron Age, changing the history of Scotland. It's quite some feat for a bowl. <laughs> a feat for a bowl, all right, yes, it certainly was that. Mm. Can anyone come out here and start rummaging around under the water there to find some amazing relics? No. Um, before I go to any lock, what I do initially is seek permission from the estate or from the trust or from uh, anybody that owns this area. I get permission for a start before I stick my head under the water. Chris's finds make some of these cranogs older than Egypt's pyramids. He's now working closely with archaeologists from England to see what other secrets they can unearth. While the cranogs in the Outer Hebrides are certainly some of the oldest, hundreds of these stone islands are scattered across Scotland, forgotten and overgrown in its locks. I'm headed back over to the mainland to the Scottish Cranog Centre in the Highlands. I'm keen to find out just how they were used thousands of years ago. And the timing is pretty great because we're in the middle of an Iron Age festival. So this is a bone whistle that is one of the earliest musical instruments in human history. And I'm gonna give it a go. Ooh, okay. And this is what some of the Cranogs would have looked like. Wow, look at this. 
Hello there. Hello, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> welcome to the welcome Cranog. To the Cranog. Yes. This is much bigger than I thought it would be. It's very spacious. It's like a TARDIS, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it looks small yes, on the is. outside and you come in and, yeah. I yeah. know we've always been wowed by that uh, illusion. Yeah. yeah, well, it's both large but also very cosy. You've got a central hearth uh, and a nice domestic sort of seating area for everybody to sit around uh, to eat their meals at the end of the day. Behind you over here, we have a little pen uh, for uh, putting the animals in over the winter, we think. And we've got, what's here? Well, basically, you've got an upper level here for sleeping in. If you've got about 20 people to get into the crown and sleep at night, then some of them may well have to sleep on these upper levels. <laughs> The festival around the reconstructed Cranog helps give a sense of what it would have been like, with people teaching traditional crafts and life skills essential to Iron Age living. Well, the plan is to make butter out of this cream using only my bare hand. Let's see how I go. It's quite cold. Who needs a whisk? That, my friends, is butter I've made with my bare hand. Give it a little go. It's definitely butter. Oh yes, nice fresh butter. I'll never buy. I'll never buy butter again. And apparently they use coracles. Yes, that round thing made of animal skin to navigate the locks and waterways. Oh, it's cold. What do you think top speed is for the really accomplished coracle paddler? Not much quicker than I'm going right now, I'll be <laughs> frank with you. So how old would this kind of structure have been? So this one is, we dated it to 500 BC. Um, this kind of thing, because yeah, this is a recent. Yeah. How much effort and time would something like that have taken to build? It took us three years to build this granog. Wow. Um, we think for them 10 months at the very most. We estimate in, in this building we've got over 700 trees together, whereas compared wow. to a roundhouse on the land, you'd be looking at about 75 trees. So, so um, why did they go to all this effort to build something out on the water? It's a good question, and there's a simple archaeological answer, um, is that we don't really know. Um, <laughs> but that, that's what's brilliant about the prehistory. Realistically, we think there's three main reasons. It's a secure structure. It's out on the water with a walkway going on. You have one way on and you have one way off. The other way you can look at is with it being out on the water as well, trade will play a role with this. You're out for everybody to see you for miles around. On top of that as well, what you might be looking at is arguably um, status. I mean, why go to all that time and all that effort um, could just be to show off. And true to Scottish weather, it started to rain. So what better way to stay dry than gathering back inside the Cranog, listening to folk songs, similar to the ones that might have been sung during the Iron Age, or maybe even the Neolithic Age, over 5,000 years ago. Now from one group of remote islands to another, you'll find the Azores way out in the Atlantic Ocean, and they're home to one of the most remote bars in the world, where sailors from around the globe collect their mail during their voyages across the Atlantic. Quase 2 mil milhas de distância, no mínimo, a algum lugar. Nós estamos em, como porto de maior eh, passagem de iates. Eh, em primeiro lugar a nível europeu e em quarto lugar a nível mundial. O que acontece é que todos os iates que vêm das Caraíbas, que vêm da, da América do Norte, que vêm da América do Sul ou da África, realmente vêm aqui até à horta. Deve ser difícil em todo o mundo encontrar uma ilha tão pequena, só com 15 mil habitantes, encontrar uma ilha que esteja uma referência a nível mundial pelo menos para quem navega. This is definitely somewhere which every cruising sailor, when they are visiting the Azores, wants to come to Cafe Sport. Jose Enrique's grandfather, and this was long before the marina was built, and yachts would be anchored here in the harbour, and his grandfather would row out to the yachts to find out whether they needed 
uh, provisions, whether they needed assistance, and a, and a lot of them asked, could he possibly hold mail for them? Uh, and this very quickly became known in the, the yachting community that you could have mail forwarded to Cafe Sport, and when you arrived in Horta, there would be a pile of ma mail waiting for you. E eu gosto de dizer que em vez de estar na fila do, do correio, estava no Peter a ler a carta com uma cerveja fresca. Eu tenho cartas que vão para para 2000 e penso que é o máximo de 25. 2020, 2019, 2000, ah, 2028. Esta é para 2028. Passam aqui ao longo do ano muitas muitos avios escola, portanto estudantes que sabem que um irmão ou uma irmã, portanto um amigo Tão bem daqui a uns anos vai fazer a mesma viagem. Em 2004, os Correios de Portugal entenderam homenagear o café e o meu pai pelos mais de 50 anos de, de serviço prestado ao Correio Internacional. No ano passado, o café fez 100 anos, os Correios também, a nível nacional, editaram três selos dedicados ao Pedro Café Sport. Há três pormenores que que os iatistas, os aventureiros, costumam fazer na ilha. O primeiro é deixar uma pintura no mural do Porto. A segunda tradição é deixar uma bandeira do seu barco ou do seu clube aqui no café. E a terceira é assinar o nosso livro de honra. Este é o primeiro logbook do Peter Café Sport. Foi feito por um iatista. O navegador, if I ever forgot your kindness, may I go straight to hell. Bill, Adrian, 1966. E as pessoas foram assinando, foram deixando pequenas mensagens. Sendo me orgulhoso por todas essas coisas que, que eles dizem aqui em relação à minha família. E, e é realmente isso que me fez continuar o um negócio da família. Todas essas pequenas coisas que fazemos, em que não ganhamos dinheiro, mas trazem-nos relações humanas. E é isso que faz a diferença. Well, do stay with us on The Travel Show, because coming up... Mike's got the latest in what's trending in travel. And the tango that's shaking things up in Buenos Aires. So, don't go away. Welcome back to The Travel Show, and we're in the little village of Kenmore, just across the loch from the Cranach Centre. And this is home to Scotland's oldest inn, or so they say. Let's go check it out. Tell me a bit about your hotel. It was built in 1572 when it was given permission by the local laird of Taymouth Castle to provide food and beverage to the local community and travellers. So I see a lot of what Rabbi, known locally as Rabbi Burns, Robert Burns, a famous Scottish poet. He's picture up there on the wall. What's the connection? Well, Rabbi Burns visited the hotel in 1782 and um, he wrote a poem on the wall. It's still there. So, so this is the, uh, the original? This is the original, Burns. yeah. Wow. So he had a few whiskeys, I'm presuming, for a buy in the bar, stood on a chair, inspiration struck, and he <laughs> wrote it on the wall. Well, that's quite a remarkable. I mean, I can't imagine there are many hotels around that can boast their own handwritten Robbie Burns poem. No, the first, the first example of graffiti in this area. <laughs> Up next, it's Mike with Trending Travel. It's now time for Trending Travel, our regular pick of the top photos, videos and stories all happening online this week. The chance for you to legally climb Uluru is officially and quickly coming to an end. October the 26th this year is the date that's been chosen to ban people from climbing the World Heritage listed site, which is also one of the planet's most recognizable natural landmarks and a sacred site for the local people. But just remember, you'll no longer be able to climb it after the 26th of October. Is this a brand new way to travel to the UK? French adventure Frankie Zapata has made the first ever successful English channel crossing between the UK and France on his jet power flyboard. 
In his previous attempt, the Frenchman fell into the sea, but this time he flew his own invention that he created three years ago across a 35 kilometer stretch of water in just 22 minutes, reaching speeds up to 170 kilometers per hour. That's a lot faster than crossing the channel by ferry. In more conventional flight news from France, starting next year, all flights to part in the country will be implementing an eco-tax as the government plans to invest in eco-friendly transport infrastructure. You'll pay between €1.50 and €18 Euros depending on your ticket and destination, but the fee will not apply to flights heading to France or connecting there. Does sorting out visas put you off visiting some countries? Well, Sri Lanka is hoping to attract tourists back following the April terrorist attacks and a drop in tourism with the offer of free visas to residents in 48 countries. If you qualify, then you have until January 1st to take up the offer. After that, the fee returns. And this month marks the start of the 2019 Rugby World Cup, which runs through to the end of October. This is the first time the competition is being held in Asia. So here is Ryuzo with our trending guide to what to see, do and expect if you're planning on heading to Japan. Japan caused a lot of excitement at the last Rugby World Cup when we famously beat the South Africans. Now it is our time to host. You might remember last year I sent off Carmen the challenge to see three of the sites in six of the host cities within the time it takes to see a rugby match. Now that the Rugby World Cup is about to kick off here in Japan, this is my guide to anyone who's visiting to see the Mighty Blossom in action. All ticket information is available at the Rugby World Cup website. But tickets are selling fast, so you better act quick. Be sure to confirm your travel plans before you arrive. I say though your best bet is taking our public transportation. If you're planning to visit multiple cities, be sure to get a Japan Rail Pass as it's much cheaper and easier. Keep in mind there are fan zones in each city near the matches. It's a great place to spend time and there are a lot of events going on. If you have your ticket, be sure to arrive an hour before to go through security and find your seat. If you're leaving the host city after the match, take some time to see the sights before you move on to the next city. This will help you avoid the crowds. Check our YouTube channel to see the full guides to these cities. Remember, a little Japanese goes a long way. Here are some useful phrases you can learn. Hello. Konnichiwa. Goodbye. Sayonara. Thank you. Arigato. Please. Onegaishimasu. Try. Torai. Good job. Yoku yatta. That's it for now. Make sure to keep sending us your stories and your photos of the places you live and the places you love. Maybe next time, you'll be trending in travel. To end this week, we're off to the Argentine capital of Buenos Aires. In recent years, it's become known as one of South America's most LGBT-friendly and open-minded cities. But its biggest cultural export, tango, is not exactly known as the most inclusive of dancers. Despite the fact that back in its early days, men often danced the tango together, mainly because of a lack of available female partners. For me, the tango is an encuentro entre two people where suceden cosas muy exquisitas que tienen que ver con el encuentro de, de dos almas. El tango para mí es el encuentro con mi pareja a través de la música, la danza, la sensualidad, el erotismo. part of our identity as Argentinians and the idea also of the male and women image is also very uh, connected with our culture. Tango is very machista. The only way to dance tango was with a man and only the men can ask women to dance. The idea of the queer tango was something very strong when we proposed it because it was something against to our culture, you know, like breaking rules. No llenaré el espacio abajo antes que alguien.
What's good about this type of milongas is uh, you practice the steps and everything in both roles. So you learn how to follow and lead. Uh, that way you, you understand both sides of the, the dancing. Eh, para mí el tango es una combinación de emociones y de activismo para eh, visibilizar eh, temas sociales como por ejemplo la homofobia en el mundo, el derecho a la identidad. Lo que proponemos también desde un principio es destruir totalmente los contenidos y códigos machistas de los ambientes tangueros. El tango es mucho más que lo que se ve en los medios o en las milongas convencionales. Eso pasa de entre el 2016 hasta ahora, donde ya es todo muy, 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 muy común. Existen las mujeres, los varones, las milongas queer, las milongas libres. Ahora ya hay un movimiento feminista de tango. Se abrieron un montón de caminos. achieved many things, but uh, what still is a challenge is the possibility for the queer people, for the gay and lesbians or trans, to dance uh, comfortable and freely in the traditional milongas. Dancers there in Argentina shaking up the tango world. Well, that's all we've got time for on this week's programme, but coming up next week. Lucy is in Switzerland, taking part in a wine festival that only happens once every 25 years and getting into a flap in the process. The sun is blazing, it's so hot. I'm melting, totally worth it. Look at this atmosphere. And in the meantime, don't forget, you can catch up with us while we're out on the road in real time by checking out our social media feeds and sharing your travels with us and the rest of the world. Until next time, from me, Crystal Larwood, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Scotland, it's goodbye.